David's already nervous that there's not enough time to do all the topics we have today. It's too much today. There's a lot, John. There's a lot going on in the world of sports business and rich dudes knowing stuff about how rich dudes do stuff. Say that three times. Rich dudes only fans, as I like to call this show. Um, John Skipper, David Sampson, hello. I feel like we should start with the tournament, John. The tournament, the NCAA tournament is happening. And I don't want to talk about the specific results as much as I want to talk about the business of this because the business, as you see it, John, mm -hmm. is ripe for change, for expansion, for uh, enrichment, potentially. Well, I think you're going to have a continuing conflict between the big schools, the big conferences, and how they run the tournament. And I'm amused that somebody thinks the way to solve all this is just add eight more teams. Uh, I'm not sure what problem you're solving by add eight more teams. This is like a couple getting married that can only has a facility can hold 100 people, and they keep looking at their list and going, we got to add more because we can't, we can't offend the Brewsters. We got to get them there. So I guess this is we can't offend Pittsburgh and we can't offend St. John's. So we need to let in eight more teams. All it means there'll be eight new teams who are mad that they didn't get in. So I don't know what problem you're solving. Ultimately, I believe, and I've said it on this show many times, I believe the big schools will eventually create their own tournament. I know everybody loves Cinderella, but I don't know, is anybody unhappy that all the best teams, all the one and two seeds have made it through? I'm pretty happy about that. Of course, that includes North Carolina. Yeah, I was going to say. People are unhappy. Uh, yeah, I, I, as, as, a non, as a non-North <laughs> oh, Carolinian, and, and, I'm a little and, bummed. And, and how exactly are people expressing this unhappiness? By not watching the games featuring North Carolina, North Carolina and Alabama? There's no. just a little bit. There's a downtick in excitement. When there's a Cinderella, when there's a Cinderella story, think about when Oakland had their great run of 24 hours the NIL deals that came the way of that player who wouldn't shoot twos. I'm just fascinated by your point of view, though, John, because, of course, when you're on the other side of the table, you want as many games as possible. Mm -hmm. So you love expansion of the tournament, mm -hmm. and you love the storylines. And if you're the NCAA, you want as many teams as possible because you're getting paid more money for it. Mm -hmm. So the March Madness TV deal is worth more if there's more games. So there's great incentive to expand it having nothing to do with the snubs. Mm -hmm. it's, there's, there's a hunger for more inventory. Uh, I'm not positive that there's that much hunger for more inventory of more mediocre teams. And there's always been in our world, basketball world, until fairly recently. Are they playing the NIT this year? Yes. I briefly Despite walked... it being rejected by numerous coaches like Rick Pitino of St. John's aforementioned, it uh, is going on. Okay, so there's no reason for us not to have two tournaments. We have a tournament for the big teams, and we have a tournament for the little teams. That's mostly what happens in the rest of the sports. They don't have a national foot. They have a Division II football championship, a Division Three football championship. I am so viscerally you're his team. I'm viscerally offended by John's vision for the NCAA tournament. It's a horrific vision, and it's funny given that when you stored at ESPN, I was happy to watch curling at three in the morning. So. There was an appetite for all sorts of well, different sports at different times. You've never heard me say, this is a tournament I prefer. I am telling you, this is the tournament we're going to get mm. at some point. Because the big schools, the big conferences, want more and more of the money. And the great, a big pot of money is the pot of money that those folks in Indianapolis spend to have a year-round presence the, the basketball tournament pays for the governance of those big conferences that those conferences don't want. They do not want Charlie Baker to tell them what to so do. So you want to get rid of automatic bids. That's it. No more Ivy League bid. No more. Well, John's even going a step beyond that. He's doing something. He's alluding, I think, to something that Greg Sankey, the commissioner of the SEC, one of the aforementioned giants that are uh, actually running college sports in general, um, Greg Sankey said uh, that smaller schools are stealing bids and that, uh, yeah, he wants to, of course, have more of the big schools, the SEC schools, assured spots inside of a tournament every year. Does that sound familiar? It sounds like what they, with the CFP, doesn't it? It sounds like literally everything, <laughs> which goes back to the Super <laughs> the, League as a concept. The, the CFP 
is going to manage to exist for 20 years and never create a tournament that has the right number of teams in it. <laughs> they seem determined to either shoot themselves in the foot that they don't have a team in the tournament. That's five commissioners creating a tournament of four. Then they're going to go to 12. Big Ten and uh, SEC, I guess, tell them that's not enough because we're going to need to get at least four of our teams in. So they're going to go to 14. Go to 16. But that's an easy thing to do. You play eight games, four games, two games, and you're done. But some of them want buys. I'm glad they won't buy us. So, <laughs> but who cares what they want? What do you mean they won't buy us? Now all we're going to have... But they're now- running it. You're saying things from both sides of your mouth. You're saying that no NCAA, they're going to do their own internal governance, just have the big conferences do it. The big conferences say they want buys, and then you say, who cares what they want? If they're governing themselves, then we'll have no governor on what happens. I, I don't disagree, but... All you're going to do is end up with whoever's third and fourth complaining that they should have been first and second. You're going to have at least two teams who are going to say, why are we not in? You're still going to have a Florida State situation. I would, I, the easiest thing to do is to have four conferences and they each get their one through four teams in. And that's, that's a simple way to not have any arguments. You take the bowl system, you invite all the other teams, let them play in the bowls. But on the college basketball front, it's interesting, too, that the ACC gets to feel like a big football conference, right? Like, that's this is their event. The college football playoff? The NCAA tournament in basketball. Well, the NCAA, NCAA tournament in basketball, they have proved year after year that they are going to outpunch what Ken Palm or whoever that's all right. these analytic companies say that they're not good. They get in, Clemson gets in, they're in, the, they're in the Final 16. There are four ACC teams in the Final 16. And there almost always is an ACC team in the Final Four. So your view is put the ACC right into the Sweet 16, have no. them get buys right there. No, my. UNC is always there. No. UNC will always be there, David, other than last year. Well, I, I want to get <laughs> <laughs> every year but last it, year. Yeah, John wants to have a sponsor's exemption <laughs> for North Carolina every year. But what does it look like, though, right? So let's actually get to your vision, right? Let's say there's a Super League-style NCAA tournament. What does that really mean in terms of who's in what? What's the cutoff for being – who gets to be in the Super League, I guess? Well, um, I don't know. It's too hard. By the way, you can't get to what I'm talking about. You've got an inso- an unsolvable conflict. Which is? Which is that the big conferences are going to – won't eventually to get all that money – and the teams that should be the tops in the top four conferences, you've already got too many intruders, no, no I'm not going to name them, in those conferences to do what, what they really want to do. Mm. I have some solutions. Can we talk solutions? Yes, please. please. Because my view is that in everything where there is competition, there are snubs. Everything, whether it's the Oscars, whether whatever award ceremony, whether it's a tournament, there's always people who feel they're not getting what they deserve. So I try to put that when you're leading an organization, you have to put that to the side. I don't think they sit around Baker and the NCAA. I don't think they sit around saying, oh, we have to solve for the snub issue. That's not, to me, forefront. My solution is that I'm working with the broadcast partners because that's the money we're talking about. And I want to know the exact amount of inventory they want across all of their platforms. I want to know, can I spread out between Turner, Warner Brothers Discovery, CBS, all the different channels. Can I get ESPN involved? Can I get Metal Arc involved? What's your appetite for a 96-team tournament? What is the incremental benefit that we will receive for those extra teams? And I'm negotiating right to the edge where it's the law of diminishing returns, where if we go to 97 teams, there's no increase from 96. 64 is not it, so they went to 68, the play-in. Is that what it's called, the play-in when, when the teams? The first four. The first four. So I don't think that's it either. I think there's going to be more, and I think you're going to see over the next contract more partners because all this hogwash about I don't know where to find the games, it's very easy to find games. So I think you're going to have more teams. There will not be a super conference. There will still be the NCAA, and there will still be automatic bids. Why? Because the conference tournaments, that is a revenue producer for the schools and for the networks. They get to show those, and automatic bids 
if you eliminate the right of a conference champion to get in, then why play the conference tournament? You kill off tournament? David. David. You kill off Yale. Yeah. I would have the Goliaths play and the Davids play 64 teams in each, which gives you the most possible inventory, allows you to bring in new partners. That would make the most money, and you'd end up with two champions. So boring. I want the David to have a chance. That's the whole point of the NCAA tournament is that you can have a, a David run. Well, that's what fans sort of think. So do you believe? Do you believe they vote with their eyeballs? You think that no, those I, Cinderella I get what John, teams? I get what ever? John's saying. I hate this idea, and yet I'm. Was I'm like, I, can I convince America to not watch these games? Um, yeah, I, I, I. Then you're agreeing with me. If America will watch games if they're part of the tournament because it's win and continue or lose and you're out, and anytime you can get a close game in the NCAA tournament with an upset. You get a news alerts pushed to your phone. Upset alert. Turn totally. to the game no, now. I, I, so th th in terms of attention and discussion, there's no question that upsets drive this thing. It's why I love the NCAA tournament inherently. I'm the guy who picks a 16 seed over a one seed every single year, no matter what. But what I guess I'm wondering is if audience will not be a check on the manifest destiny of we want to have the big school tournament because we can get, get more money that way, then what's stopping them? That what's stopping them is getting uh, getting coordinated and getting people to think they can do it. By the way, nobody, while you say everybody wants that, what, the, what does the network want? They want Duke, Kentucky. Only at the end. And they, and they do not want anybody to upset Duke and Kentucky because the highest rated games in the tournament are the six possible games that Duke, Kentucky, <laughs> UConn, North Carolina, Arizona, that, that's what they want. The, the networks, for the most part, would really like chalk. They want the best teams to win in advance because mm. every time Kentucky, the five games Kentucky didn't get to play cost the network money. Wow. Can wow. you quantify that? No. Um, I mean, cause cause I, I I'm don't trying know. to understand the difference on April 8th when you've got a Duke playing a, a, a Cinderella team. You're saying that incrementally Duke playing Kentucky would have been better by X, the factor of X, and that impacts what they offer the NCAA over the life of a tournament? Yes. Uh, the, I'm, I'm interested yes, to hear yes, that because the, I don't... The only revenue, really, that CBS, true tar, TBS can generate is ad sales. I mean, they are getting some fees from the, old, from the pay television system, but they... The amount of people who watch is directly correlated to the amount of ad revenue they can recognize. So what you're saying that what you're saying is that boring from a sports conversation perspective, even from a viewership perspective as a fan eager to watch a game, is not the same as the total tonnage of eyeballs yeah. simply because of the demographics of how big these fan bases are. In baseball, did anybody ever want you to make the World Series? No, but it's not as big a appointment viewing as the NCAA final game is. Right. So I view the NCAA final game differently, like I view the Super Bowl differently. I'm not sure that ESPN would say to itself, hey, why can't we have Dallas against you know, the Chiefs? That'd mm -hmm. be ideal, but if somehow a team makes a run to the Super Bowl that has you know, Taylor Swift's boyfriend on it, it's a positive because you're getting different demographics, you're getting great viewers oh. who just watch that game no matter who's playing, and I view that NCAA tournament, the final game as well. The real money and the reason why the contracts were so much is it's multiple weekends mm -hmm. where you're keeping the attention and you're able to program around it during the weeks in mm -hmm. between Sunday to Thursday when there's no games for the yeah. first two, three weeks. That's why I want to sit with the network and get an idea of how many more weekends do you need right. how, in your calendar? How many can we take? Yeah. I'm not sure you can take many more weekends. It can take more games. Right, you can put more games on, but um, I don't think they can take many more weekends because most of them have something. Somebody, CBS, and CBS runs right into the Masters. They can't go the next weekend. I was thinking the weekend prior, but that's something that people don't talk enough about and fascinates me is the programming schedule the networks have where people used to complain to me, why don't you move the World Series into this weekend? Right. And we would say, well, actually, um, Fox can't show it that weekend. Right. So we literally don't have an opportunity. We have to go to Fox for a rainout right. and when to reschedule it. Right.
I want to know what to do with the NIT, John, because here's this seemingly distressed asset, and we've discovered that, okay, a lot can change in this tournament genre. What do you do with it? If I was the NIT, I would try to work with co smaller conferences and convince them that they will get more members in if they participate in that conference, uh, and they'll get the same money. Mm. I assume that's what they do anyway. The NIT was always the, the people who couldn't make the NCAA tournament. And it was always a nice thing to win the NIT tournament. Yeah. I can't remember who won last year, but I couldn't remember who won the NCAA tournament either until I read the Connecticut's repeating. I'm terrible at that. Yeah, your general cognitive function, not necessarily representative of... <laughs> Do you know who won the NIT last year? Best practice. Of course not. So the one you're talking about. Of course about. not. But the point being that you not knowing either champion is not indicative of the equivalency between these two products. And the question then becomes, if you're <laughs> yes. the NIT, how do you fit into this strategy? Is there room for this other thing? And, and this gets us, of course, by the way, to the other other thing, which is the women's NCAA tournament, while we're all wringing our hands about the men, is actually clearly like on a trajectory that is um, unprecedented, unthinkable, and now resetting, John, it seems, expectations that previous presidents of media companies might have had for what this is. This, this is a uh, classic, right? This is the everything that people predict will happen happens slower than anybody thinks until it finally begins to happen, and it then it fast. happens fast. <laughs> and this has happened really fast. Yeah. And I do not think it's uh, a blip. I think that this is a permanent change uh, and that people are going to care. I think the last number I saw was that the women's tournament is up 180% in viewing. And it's not just Caitlin Clark. That it did is. It. It's a blip. I, I don't think it is. I think you'll have very good. I always thought that when the women's tournament is genuinely competitive, when there are enough good players that you actually care and whether it actually can be upset, it will matter. Uh, before, UConn was so dominant, UConn, Tennessee, Louisiana Tech were so dominant that it wasn't that interesting. Uh, now, it's quite interesting because the players, there are lots and lots of good players, yes. and Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark and Juju, Juju Watkins, Juju Watkins yep. will be replaced by Paige three Beckers. women after that who will be just as dynamic and good and the tournament will do very well because you got those uniforms on. So the people of Ohio State care now because they're pretty good. South Carolina, uh, there's a lot of good teams, and there have been upsets this year, and there have been standout players. So I, I think this is a, a sign of things to come to yeah. be. Hannah Hidalgo at Notre Dame. I mean, the list goes on in terms of just like people, players who are becoming characters that can – seemingly drive viewership, but David is, you're selling high, is what you're saying. You I, I'm selling high because I'm selling the Caitlin Clark effect. I, I've never seen an athlete like her. I've never seen someone grab the attention. It's the equivalent of Fernando mania. God, that's aging me, but take Lynn Sanity, take whatever example you want. And I didn't say that just because of yeah, your, your felt, involvement in the show. Like Sorry, don't want to marginalize you. Thank Anything you. That, you, that you can just, that, that is a moment uh -huh. and this is a moment for women as it should have been for decades and centuries. This is where there's more attention on women's sports granted. Mm -hmm. But what you're seeing in the shape of the curve is not solely because of that, that uh -huh. now we're recognizing women as equals, which should have happened forever ago. Kaylin Clark has made that curve change and she's gonna go to the Indiana Fever and try to make the WNBA's curve change, mm -hmm. but it's gonna come at the expense of the college basketball curve. I, she can't be in two places at once, so I don't believe that she will have the ability. We could argue whether she'll be this successful in the WNBA, but I understand why you want it to be the case where mm -hmm. you want this sustained uh, improvement in everything, but I think you'd agree the slope of the curve is not sustainable. Well, it doesn't need to be. Well, the slope of the curve is sustainable. It will, it will level out. It won't go up another 180% next year. But it's not going to return to previous levels, I don't think. There's too many good players. And because of Caitlin Clark, many, many more people have watched the games and they're discovering that these women can really play. That is, that is true. Well, it also, so I think the argument here is about the steepness of the increase, right? And is there going to be a decline as a function of simply that? But meanwhile, I want to point out, like, 
WNBA viewership, and again, everything is up because out-of-home viewing has been factored in for those sports TV ratings nerds out there. You know this, Nielsen, factoring in bars and all that stuff, hotels, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the WNBA Finals 2023, um, highest viewership on TV in 20 years. Um, those numbers all seem to be trending in a direction, John. Um, and look, I, I just be real about the WNBA, a contract that ESPN has held for a long time, it just seems like a materially different product than what it was considered before, which is like the piggybacked thing you get right. if you get the NBA. Well, I think they're talking about separating the rights deals for the first time, right? Uh, which would be a good idea, I think, because they should get that, that value. And again, I will, I'll agree with you on one thing. I will take the over-under that Iowa's ratings will go down next year. <laughs> good boy. <laughs> Talk about adding value to our audience right there. <laughs> so good. Uh, Let's, uh... I don't think they'll bifurcate the ratings so fast because WNBA will go out into the market and realize that it would actually be a blight on their reputation when they see what the value is on its own. And when you can tuck it in under a new NBA deal, which Adam is negotiating, that's going to be a huge increase. You can then allocate a number to the WNBA that would show the WNBA increasing at a number that may be artificially inflated. So I actually think that it would be silly of them to separate now. It's too early, you're saying? Yes, sir. I want to stay with the women's game because there's another story about, uh, let's call it PR management. Um, because Kim Mulkey, the head coach um, in question here of LSU, uh, she's threatening to sue the Washington Post and has done this in public um, over a piece yet to be released as of press time for us um, by Kent Babb, who's a, uh, a known sports writer, respectable sports writer, Good sports writer. Um, and just to get a sense of what Kim Mulkey is saying, she's saying, quote, the lengths he has gone to try to put a hit piece together. After two years of trying to get me to sit with him for an interview, he contacts LSU on Tuesday as we were getting ready for the first round game of this tournament with more than a dozen questions demanding a response by Thursday, right before we're scheduled to tip off. Are you kidding me? Ridiculous deadline. Couldn't possibly meet it. Attempt to distract. It ain't going to work, buddy. Et cetera, et cetera. Did she say buddy? Yeah, she did. It is she going to work, buddy. buddy. I've hired the best defamation so law insulting. from the country. I will sue the Washington Post if they publish a false story about me. She cannot possibly have hired the best defamation lawsuit or law firm in the country because any uh, competent uh, defamation attorney is going to tell her that she has no case. Uh, the Washington Post is not going to defame her. The definition of defaming is that you publish something that you know is not true with the deliberate intention of hurting somebody. That is not going to be the case here. So are you saying there's a law firm that wouldn't take a retainer waiting for the piece I'm to come sure out? I'm sure there would. I think that woman, who is that woman, Sydney Powell? I think she <laughs> may be available. And I know Giuliani's available. I think, uh, he's going to have to get some. I think he's disbarred. I, I think what bothered me about this, and I was watching it, and I was thinking about it a lot, that what gall she has where in the same sentence she says, for two years he's been trying to get me, but there's no way he gave me enough time by contacting me two days before. What the Washington Post did, and I've gotten these calls from me to come, is, hey, we're coming out with a story that we're working on. Do you want to comment? And I've also gotten the calls, hey, we're coming out with this story tomorrow. Uh, we're giving you an opportunity to comment. So I've seen it both ways. Yep. And the newspaper's job is not to care when my next game is or what I'm distracted by. Their job is to see if I'll comment, and their job, which they do well, is to present the facts, have it fact-checked, which there's fact-checking to every article. It's lawyered. Mm -hmm. Every sentence is lawyered. For an lawyered. article like this, deeply lawyered. I mean, not a game recap, yes, but an article like this, a quote-unquote hit piece is what you call it, the lawyers will have approved everything with an eye toward a defamation suit. They don't want to be susceptible to that. So I didn't know why she was protesting so much. And now I'm going to read the article where before, if she didn't do this press conference, I would have read right past it. She's, she's just taken from the playbook of if you think something bad's going to get published, go ahead and say it's fake, it's wrong. Enemy of the people. And, and, and they don't care. I mean, she, by the way, she characterizes the Brian Kelly article as a hit piece. Which right. is not post previously yeah, had reported. Which, which is not clear it was. No. Uh, no. I'm going to have to reveal I haven't read it, but I have read the analysis of it. It's and not. It basically it really was a piece about the fact that one of the poorest states in the country has prioritized paying Brian Kelly nine million, nine million dollars a year 
By the way, my guess is you had the Louisiana population vote over whether they'd like to pay $10 million for a coach and win a national championship. They would. I suppose that in the Streisand affecting of this, in which we're going to pay attention to this story when it comes out in ways that we wouldn't have otherwise, um, it brings us to the other even larger PR management story in sports, if you guys are okay to go there. Because the Otani thing, as we sit on it now, um, so much is happening, so much has happened, I should say. Now it seems to be a bit of a, a resting state. And my in on this story with you guys, after seeing his press conference, after seeing the reports from ESPN and other places about the back and forth as to was Otani robbed, as he is now claiming, having $4.5 million stolen from him, or was he actually betting on the game? And what game it is, is of course, not baseball according to Otani, and not anything according to Otani, but according to the translator in question, his best friend, personal assistant, no longer his best friend ostensibly, was other sports that are not baseball. Um, all of that, it leads me to ask you guys, losing track of $4.5 million, this is, again, rich guys talking about rich guy stuff, how plausible is that? Could you imagine that happening? Let's talk about this from an athlete standpoint. I would say yes. There are players who I've had who if you ask them what their balance was in their account, they would say they didn't know. I've had players including my favorite second baseman, a guy named Luis Castillo, who was not aware that his paycheck was not being deposited because he thought he had direct deposit and he had not signed up for it. So his paychecks were building up in his locker and it happened that our finance department contacted me and said, Luis Castillo has about $6 million of checks he has not deposited. <laughs> and so we went up to him and he said, oh, Poppy, I had no idea. Literally, that's what he said. So is it possible that Otani doesn't know the balance? Yes. Is it possible he doesn't pay his own bills? 100%. There's people who pay firms or individuals to pay their bills for them. Easy peasy. Is it possible that he's off by four and a half million with his balance knowledge? 100%. He's got money to do whatever he wants whenever he wants to. Is it possible that his account wired money to an illegal bookmaker without Otani knowing or one of his agents? That is impossible. It seems quite implausible. Uh, I have a lot less money than Mr. Otani, but I cannot, nobody can get to my money and wire $10,000 out of the account without them calling me. I cannot imagine you'd have some system set up or that somebody at the bank didn't go, oh, this is the ninth, is it nine? This is the ninth half a million dollar check going it's to some party so <laughs> that I can't find uh, in the yellow pages. It's thing. literally absurd. And what bothers me is that Otani did this statement. And you as a journalist, I would assume you would not have gone to that once you were not allowed to ask questions and you realized it was not a press conference. 70 of your colleagues still went, which upset me. I wanted them all to reject it and not show up because all I did was read a statement. That's not a press conference. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So that's insulting to journalists, number one. Number two, he didn't answer the very simple question that he could have answered, which is, yeah, uh, I gave this guy Epay total authority and the bank I use is Citibank and he's been doing wires for me you know, for six years. That would have been something he could have said, but he didn't. And that's the biggest question, not did he lose track of four and a half million dollars. Yeah, I think the question to me is just how plausibly scammable is Shohei Otani when it comes to a guy in his interpreter slash personal assistant slash best friend who's been with him since Japan, who has falsified other parts of his resume we now know, didn't graduate from UC Riverside, didn't translate for Hideki Okajima, the former reliever with the Red Sox and the Yankees. So this guy is shady. And now the question is, Otani... You mentioned these phone calls from your bank when you're trying to wire money, right? If Otani is getting incoming phone calls of a financial nature, is his literal translator the person answering the phone talking in English to the bank? And is that an excuse, a plausible excuse, given the specific context of Guy relying on someone else as his, essentially his, his ward when it comes to important matters in his life in English. Yeah, this would be fantastic if the bank said in English, hey, we're wiring $500,000 to 
John Cocktoast and the bookie. And the interpreter says to Otani, yes, this wire for 50000 is going to the Audi car company. And he says right. that in Japanese. Otani says yes. The bank hears yes. And then $500,000 is out the door. No. <laughs> well, look, the question, though, but this, this is, it lines up with a larger through line, which you spoke to, both of you guys spoke to, which is that actually having lots of money does not mean you are financially sophisticated or diligent or detail oriented. Almost the opposite. <laughs> but, and but that's not what people yeah. understand here is just that there is no correlation in all of these industries with money that you actually know what you're doing with your money second to second. Yeah, and I want to make sure, I don't think either you or I are suggesting that Otani is guilty of doing anything other than being duped in a way, right? I mean, I don't think the natural- Do you know? No, I do not know. I don't either. But, so the question- but it, the, the, I but just you're don't, John, I'm the, not the, willing to say it yet because I don't buy the story that, that the wires, if the wires came from his account, I'm not buying the fact that he or his advisors weren't aware of it. Right. So look, the nuance is, was Otani doing this to cover up his own bets? Was he doing it to help a friend knowingly, which is what, of course, the interpreter claimed with Otani's camp's blessing initially to ESPN in a 90 minute interview. And then they realized, ah, shit, we shouldn't say that because it's an illegal bookmaker. And now is all of this simply to clean up that, to sever that connectivity? It certainly that feels that has. way. His whole statement was merely he was re saying what he had said after they changed their story. That's right. all he did. Right. That's why there's an investigation. And it's not just MLB. We're talking about the IRS. There's so many financial implications to what is their story. And the fact that there's a theft, there's been a report now that there's, there's people looking into this, ESPN and other real journalists, right. investigative journalists. Everyone. They can't find anyone who's looking into this theft, any authority, according to that, an ESPN that report. That Otani's camp has personally gone to. Because they said that, hey, we so turned this is over looking to into the authorities. It, but it's not because Otani's camp reportedly exactly. has asked them to. And so their attempt to minimize a financial scandal around betting, I suppose, brings us to the other financial scandal involving betting that I want to get to. Um, because this is John Day Porter's story, man. Like, feels, it just feels like the nightmare in ways that the Otani story was merely an appetizer towards, despite John Tay Porter being somebody that I would imagine 99% of America has never heard of before. And so I just wanna give you the very brief beats for people who aren't not familiar with John Tay Porter's oeuvre. Um, January 26th, game against the Clippers. Uh, there was increased betting interest on the under for a John Tay Porter prop bet. And the line there uh, for this prop bet uh, set around 5.5 points, 4.5 rebounds, 1.5 assists, also an over-under for made three-pointers, which was 0 0.5. So we just get a sense of like, we're not expecting a lot out of this dude, but we can bet on his statistical benchmarks. That evening, he plays four minutes, he leaves the game. The Raptors say there's an eye injury, it's aggravated. He had suffered it actually four days early against the Grizzlies. And Jonte Porter leaves the game having not scored having had three rebounds, having had one assist, and not attempting a three, hitting the under on every single prop. And then playing the next game. And the next game, um, well, the next day, actually, we should say DraftKings Sportsbook, they say that the under on Jonte Porter's three-pointers was the biggest money winner for betters of any NBA player prop from games that evening, okay? This does not feel like it's going to be that difficult to figure out if there was big money on him before he touched the court, why would there be big money on John Tay Porter? The only reason is that somebody knows something. It will be the responsibility of the leagues to investigate that. And I'm assuming if John Tay Porter is found to have been culpable, and I have no knowledge of anything to know that he's culpable, other than this looks awfully odd. And uh, I'm assuming his playing career will be very short after this, and then that will be quite a, uh, um, a deterrent for other people to attempt to do similarly stupid things if, they, in fact, that's what he's done. We don't, I don't know enough about this it. This is where we have to say that we're a DraftKings-sponsored yeah. show, and as is nothing personal, new to DraftKings Network. So this compliment to DraftKings, I would have said even were those things not to be true. The technology and what they're doing, working with the leagues, getting the information to the leagues, these companies are doing everything they're supposed to do. Now it's the league's turn. If I'm the NBA or the president of a team, 
I'm calling up my friend Adam or calling John to call my friend Adam and say, listen, we need to do something because this is the perfect, perfect person to make an example of. This isn't LeBron James. This isn't Shohei Otani. This is John Tay Porter. We need to suspend him for life. Find a if way to fact, find out. If in fact I, I, he is I, culpable. I'm going to, okay, we can say if in fact he's culpable. I want an investigation right now because the systems we've put in place, I want the fans to know that these systems are working. That when you right. see irregularities, you're contacting us, we're then investigating, and then we're acting on the investigation. There is no way that the under on Jean Tay Porter was the biggest play in the NBA, and then he leaves the game in three minutes. It's just not. It feels It, it doesn't unlikely. pass the smell test. Yeah. And yeah. this is a time for the NBA to make a move. So a little cleanup. The second game in question was March 20th, uh, some weeks later. But again, same deal. Only put a couple minutes due to, Ill due to an illness. Heavy bets on his prop unders. Um, and yeah, it ranked super highly in terms of the sports books. Uh, you know, own internal data on, on uh, here's where the technology needs to get a little better. And I, and I know DraftKings is working on it as are the leagues. I want to get the information to the leagues before tip off. When there is irregular betting, would, would anybody be against stopping all prop bets five minutes before a tip off? Is that, is that not good? Does all the money come within the last five minutes? I don't want to take money out of anybody's pocket. No, but, but these I do are not the, know that. I, the, I think these are the questions about trade-offs that everyone has to contemplate, right? Like, so I, I should point out this too. I, I'm not a, I'm not a natural uh, better. I'm not someone who knows all the ins and outs. But it's obvious to me that a big difference in the era of legalized gambling, which I believe in philosophically, is better than the system that was before, where it was all illicit, and of course things happened that were incredibly shady and suspicious under that black market regime. The difference of legalized gambling is that now you have this menu of everything essentially seemingly being bettable. And so John Tay Porter props didn't exist before, now they do. And so the question is, where do you turn the dials on what minimums you have to hit, on time constraints, on like talking to Coco before the show, he had this idea, which I thought was very interesting. What if you make it so that you can only bet on props for guys who play X number of minutes in the NBA? minimum so that you filter out the guys who can most easily disappear seemingly having done nothing and yet done quite a bit to damage the integrity of the game i love his idea and there'll be many of many ideas like it and the technology is going to keep getting better and in theory the ultimate payoff is getting information to leagues before tip-off and that then eliminates imagine if the rockets are told it took till halftime of the ncaa to get to the referee who had the conflict of interest in the Chattanooga game. You read about, I hope you read about that. Please there was explain. an NCAA referee who got pulled from refereeing an NCAA tournament game because did not disclose the conflict having I, gotten a I degree. Don't pay, as you know, I don't pay any attention to games that don't involve the big, uh, the big conferences. So I'm so unaware it, of the Chattanooga. It took the NCAA until halftime to get this referee pulled. They went into the locker room and said, you can't referee because you forgot to disclose that you have a conflict. So obviously they're one half too late. Ideally, they would have figured this out before the game started. I would think the NCAA getting something half right would be uh, above a average. Such a <laughs> hater of the NCAA. <laughs> I'm so not a I hater. Think you are. It's fine. You want the Super League. You want you want you because you're a fan of teams that would be in the Super League. No, no, you you mistake my comments. My comments are are I don't hate the NCAA. I dislike their lack of effectiveness and how long it takes him to make decisions. And the fact that Jim Boeheim, uh, and I'm not particularly a Syracuse fan, loses 200 games like six years later um, because it takes them that long to figure out, figure something yeah, half out. Halftime is they actually are, ahead of schedule. Yeah, They're doing that's, great. That's my yeah. point. If they Congrats. Figured this, they figured this out. This is the shortest investigation in the history of the NCAA. So I think that the end of the story is that these prop bets, it's going to continue. It's good business, and it's the league has embraced it and should, but they will continue to work on how to enforce, and that's why I'm watching for discipline because this is, the, as I said, the right a player classic, to discipline. A classic scared straight kind of a character to use to show on presentations in the preseason. You no, know, he's Michael Porter's camp. brother. Yeah. And he, the th champion who makes a lot of money, who, makes over $30 million a year. Yeah, 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 and it comes from a family who is not, it's, it's not the classic hard up, oh, flag this guy. 
Although he did have, did have interesting crypto and all that, which is its own red flag, I suppose. But look, the question of like how states and governments regulate this, of course, is also part of the conversation. It's interesting that in New York, right? I believe this is true, Coco, correct me if I'm wrong in my ear, but you can't bet on college player props because there is some recognition that that's a vulnerable population when it comes to the cost benefit, the logic, right? What we're talking about is truly, we've created all of these, if not entirely new, then certainly ever more conspicuous incentives. And the question is the cost benefit for these individual actors, who is most likely to follow those incentives to a logical conclusion when it comes to personal profit? And so you can have the government step in, you can have the league step in, you can have the sports books themselves step in. And I think all of them are going to have to figure out, we live in an era in which we want this to be legalized. I am not going to go the other way on that. I think like all of these vices that we have in America, disclosure, uh, responsible treatment programs, genuine transparency, and regulation is the solution to marijuana, to drug use at large, to alcohol, to all of the cigarettes, all of this stuff. But it's not fixable when it comes to let's eliminate all the incentives that would want to make somebody, I don't know, take the under on themselves. I mean, you're giving the commercial for the, the way our population thinks about regulation and government, big government, government involvement versus not. Because what you're doing is you're just adding, you're adding a group of people or a situation where you want more government regulation. Yes. I, I get what you're saying. And the, the, the trade-off always is to think about is where does that slippery slope end? How involved do we want our government to be? Can't we have the NCAA, the ineffective mm -hmm. NCAA that you can't stand or dislike how slow they are? Which is it exactly? You dislike that they can't effectively govern. I dislike that they cannot effectively govern. All right, so he's on record with that now. So we can confidently say that. Wait, who's going to govern when there's no NCA? The conferences themselves? Yes. And you found that that works? Uh, it'll work for them. I like that we've now <laughs> Can we do a whole show on this, please? To a deposition. Because I can't, I, I, I no, talk but, to John but, but, about it, this it, every it, week. It speaks, and he, but this speaks to what we're talking about, which is who is doing the regulating? Who is the check and the balance on an economy that is now flush with money that everybody wants? And arguably, uh, will never say no to when given the alternative of way less. Yes, and that's why I don't believe that it's DraftKings. It's not their job to figure out how to regulate or punish Porter. So it's their job to give the info, info which be. they've done. Right. And so it you, can't be or can be. Cannot be. Right. I, I think that when it comes to the state question, and by the way, I'm not somebody who wants the nanny state for all of these things. I've just seen the value of taxing, right? Taxing legal marijuana regulating it versus just having it live on the black market. Um, but to this general concept, uh, no college prop bets uh, in America, the states that don't have those, uh, Arizona, Colorado, Maryland, Massachusetts, Ohio, Oregon, New York, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia. So a deeply decentralized approach. There's no federal approach. Red and blue everywhere. But you may draw some conclusions about which nanny states like to nanny. So I'm fascinated to see where this ends with props. NCAA is trying to figure out a way and they're trying to go the federal route to eliminate college prop bets in all states. And there's, they're gonna want some sort of impact statement from the companies right. and from leagues. And it's gonna be, it's a tough one. Does, does a company like DraftKings come out against this? Do they come out in favor of it? Are they neutral? I think that the revenue they, they would get from this gets replaced because people want to gamble and they will find different things to gamble on if they can't gamble yeah. on college props. I, I'm actually sort of in Pablo's camp here with the nanny state. I wouldn't call it a nanny state. This That's bad would politics be, by me, the, this, cell phone. It, it would be one of the things that all these companies are dealing and the leagues are dealing with now is, I don't know how many states it's now legal in, 35, somewhere between 35 and 40. But I may be wrong, I've read uh, that And there are 35 to 40 different sets of rules it's inefficient. Yeah. Uh, it would be much better to have, in this case, federal oversight. At one point, I think everybody thought the the, that the legislature at some point would pass, the U.S. Uh, Congress would pass uh, guidelines for uh, online betting, and they have not. 
Think about the government, that there's certain things that they leave to the states, and we're okay with as, as, as citizens. When we're driving on the highway, one, sometimes it's 70 miles per hour speed limit, then we cross state lines, and it's 65, and we adjust on the fly. There's certain things that we don't want to adjust to. Differences in how airplanes get regulated. Right. We want every state, when I go to an airport, that everybody is treating their planes the same and way FAA. other than Boeing. So you want the FAA. To me, gambling, I don't know that it has to be federally regulated. Mm -hmm. When there's people in different states, you turn your phone on and you say, oh, that's not available here. All right. And then you go on to what is available. So I don't know if this rises to the level of things that need to be federally handled, but it is going to be I'm, an interesting case. Yeah, I'm a Hamiltonian. We would have been better. We would have been better off without the states being quite so powerful, and we see the result of that right now. Uh, and we, we end up with basically two sets of states that do different things. And I'm not positive that's advantageous. I th I, I I understand why you're saying that, and we're not going to get too political here. But I think I John think just alluded to issue. Federalist Number Twenty Eight, yeah, so we are well beyond. <laughs> The point at which we are unpolitical. Yeah. I think that I would rather look issue by issue than make blanket statements the way you're making. That's probably who was. Yeah, I think, look, the question here. I love you, man. <laughs> the question here um, is how do you prevent uh, what used to be an existential risk from feeling like it, right? Let's talk about this from the theater of it. I think David started there, right? You want to make it so that no one worries about this, even though it's now literally a story that comes up every two days. So do we believe that we've gone backwards or forwards in terms of the integrity of the games? I, I would suggest that we've probably gone forward. I think we've gone sideways. I think that these gambling issues have always existed. They were just left undercover for a long time. There were never companies investigating, looking right. at trends, and then reporting them to the league. So it's one of those things where there's, there's social media, there's video of everything, so people have this strange recency bias. There's a lot more crime on subway in New York is a great one. But if you look at the stats of it, it's actually not the case. Yeah. But every time there is one, we get horrible video of it that we look at, and it's a total nightmare. There are more planes where the tires are falling off. I we just don't know. I imagine, and, and this is semi-informed speculation, so take it for what it's worth, I imagine that the leagues are enforcing and monitoring and punishing even in ways that are not disclosed to the public because the technology is such that, to David's point, you can actually be ahead of this. And I think for that reason, I, I believe that we probably are better definitively than we used to be in protecting integrity of the game. The question is, are the incentives so great that these marginal cases, right? So Dante Porter did not affect the outcome of the game. He affected the historical record from being as pure as it would have otherwise been in the absence of prop bets. And that's what we're losing. Can we stop that while we're also really so much better at preventing game fixing as a factual matter? I think we probably are. I think the technology has probably made it better. And my guess would be there was more cheating uh, in the past. Yeah, I, I still will stick with where I was, which is it's just being caught more uh, than, than it was. The players have been gambling forever. Uh, people have been betting on sports forever. Yep. It's just way easier now on a phone than meeting some guy at the corner grocery store on Sundays to pay your tab. Yeah. Those people now, but it's also, I could argue, more under control because other than the interpreter, you have to bet with money that you deposit. Where with a bookie... <laughs> other than the interpreter. It's the, uh, well, he couldn't have... <laughs> Other than, right, you have, it's all money you have, as opposed to the bookies where it's money that you don't have. And I think the reality is that there isn't supposed to be. There is no easy solution definitionally. And what we're seeing truly is what John had alluded to before, which is something happening slowly, and then suddenly the avalanche of this month specifically, all of it happening at the same time. It's like someone dying. It's really quick at the end, even if they've been dying for years, like right? the last day. It's yeah, like that last very, moment. Very fast. I, I once asked somebody how some member of their family was, uh, and they'd been sick. And I said, how's he doing? He said, he's dead. And I said, that's as sick as you can be. <laughs> <laughs> On that perfect note, John Skipper, David Sampson, thank you for spending some of your, some of your days with me as long as you still have them. Thank you, Pablo. <laughs>